I was born the very year that the Great Depression started. Of course, that impacted our lives quite a bit. We felt poor, but then a lot of other people were poor at the same time. We, I was born in Murray at my grandmother's house, but we were raised in West Jordan on a farm. It was really kind of on the border of South Jordan, but we always <coughs> called it West Jordan, and we went to the West Jordan schools. We had no indoor plumbing nor running water, so every drop of water had to be pumped from a pump outside. And that, uh, it was very hard water. It had a taste to it, but we got used to it and we liked that taste, whereas other people who tasted it did not really like it. It had a lot of <clears throat> iron in, I think. It tasted that way. And we had to work hard. I never remember a time when we didn't have lots of chores to do. Weeding, gathering turkey eggs, chicken eggs, and feeding all the animals. We had cows and horses and sheep and some rabbits and chickens and turkeys. My parents didn't marry until later in life. My mother was 33 and my father was 30. But they did get married and they had first my sister who was born in a hospital and I was number two child born in my grandmother's house. Then when it was time for my little brother to be born, my mother went back to the hospital saying, I wouldn't do that to my mother again. The house where I was born is still standing in Murray. And every once in a while I like to go uh, visit there. I have a picture of myself sitting on a farm horse and I don't know if that was the occasion when the horse decided to run. But I do remember I was perhaps three, maybe even four. And as the horse ran, I slipped off, but I hung on to the harness. And my father was yelling, whoa, and my mother was yelling, hang on. I still remember that. And the horse came to a gate and stopped. So no, no injuries were incurred in that episode, but we rode horses a lot. We herded cows and turkeys on horseback. We uh, drove horses when we did farm work. My father did not have a tractor, and so he used horses. We hauled hay. And I remember one night, well, quite often we worked till dark. I remember one night coming home on the wagon and looking up at all those stars and wondering, I wonder what my future life is going to be like. I had no idea. Also, my father raised bees. And I had seen him take a swarm off of a, a tree or a post and put it in a super. And so I saw a swarm of bees hanging from a protruding limb on our sheep shed. So I immediately got a wheelbarrow, put the super, which is the hive part, underneath so I wheeled the wheelbarrow underneath the swarm. Then I took a stick and swiped them off and they fell into the super, but many of them came after me and running as fast as I could, I still got stung many times. So I think I learned from that experience that you had to be really careful. Now when my father took a swarm into a hive. He either smoked them or in the late evening you could do it also when they're sleepy 
they they don't sting at night apparently and so I had seen him do that so I thought well I could also capture a swarm even though we had to do lots of weeding picking strawberries picking fruit uh, doing many chores still many times at night we could play with the neighbor kids they did not live close to us but we could walk along the canal bank first there were the former family and that was about a quarter of a mile away and then the Price family and they had a big family lots of kids they could have two teams to uh, two baseball teams and play against each other and so they were fun and then the Browns lived next to them. My father had purchased a piece of property uh, from Mr. Price and so ever after that 10 acres was the Price place. He purchased a horse from Mr. Brown. It was a black horse and so it was the black brown horse. <laughs> don't, don't get me laughing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay cut that part out. <laughs> at, at night, even though we had worked usually most of the day, we still had enough energy to play with the neighbor kids and some of the games we played were Andy I over where you would throw a baseball over the top of the roof of a house or no bears out tonight and that one really scared me because we played it in the dark and I was afraid of the dark for several years because I would always think there might be bears hiding there. Before my mother was married, she worked in Salt Lake City at a millinery shop and they made hats. So after she was married, she quite often made hats for us, quite professional looking and also for some of the relatives who, who wanted hats. She made artificial flowers. The house where we lived was what we call a dry farm because the canal, which, is, which was above that area, went dry during the Depression. Not only was there a depression, but there was also a drought occurring at the same time. So. There was no water in the 80 or so acres where we lived, but that's why we depended on the price place for our vegetables and fruit where we raised strawberries also. But after the water came back and they got electricity, my mother stopped making flowers for some reason. And then my father was raised on a farm, so he naturally wanted to be a farmer. He had not only the Price Place, the 80 acres around our house, but another area that was called the Sand Hills. And that was a marvelous place because there were, were interesting wildflowers. There were horny toads. There were kangaroo mice. and. Once I saw a coyote there, so that that was kind of a special place for us. And there were dead trees there along the perimeter of the fields, and they the bark had come off, and they were kind of silvery. So, yeah, they were dead and had just kind of an interesting feel about that area. My father was a farmer, but he loved books. He knew a great deal about the history of America and especially the history of Utah. He knew where the old fortresses were when the pioneers first settled in uh, West Jordan. There was White's Fort and he knew exactly where that was on the Bingham Creek and there were no, nothing left there, but I remember his taking us there and showing us this was where White's Fort was. He loved reading books and collected every kind of book that he could. And once, when 
a library, I don't know if it was in West Jordan or Midvale, they were discarding some books. And so he bought a truckload of discarded books and the grandchildren really enjoyed those and people would just pick through and see which books they might like. And my father worked at the sugar factory at nights during the winter. We raised sugar beets and he also worked at the factory and sometimes I don't know how this would happen, but the sugar would get caramelized and so they wouldn't, they would throw those pieces away and he would bring them home as candy for us when we were children. So he would get home about midnight or a little after and so sometimes we would wait up for him so that we could get the caramel candy. During World War II, my father was working at the small arms plant in Salt Lake County, and when that closed, uh, he had an opportunity to work in Richland, Washington, where they were making something that was top secret at the time, and he did not know what they were making, but he participated in building the, the buildings there. and. He stayed there. He didn't come home on weekends or anything like that. Maybe a couple of times a year he came home, which meant that the rest of us, my mother, my little brother John, my older sister Maureen, and I ran the farm. My sister was able to, with the horses, uh, plant the grain, and my brother did plowing with four horses hooked to the plow when he was fairly young. In fact, he had done that before my father went to Richland. I think I remember a picture of him as just maybe 10 or 11, well, probably 10 or 11, uh, driving those four horses and plowing. I tried plowing, but I couldn't make a straight furrow. My sister was very gifted at working with the horses and harvesting the, the crops, and I just kind of tagged along. During my uh, early years in school, my father had arranged for the bus to come to our yard and turn around and pick us up, but that was only in the winter, for a couple of months in the winter. During the rest of the time, we walked a mile to catch the bus at the Jones's Corner. And that was sometimes tiring. Uh, we also had bicycles when we grew a little bit older and were able to ride the bikes there and leave them in the Jones's yard. I remember one winter day the bus did not come to our house because it was snowing and blowing, and my father thought that we should go to school, so he harnessed the horses to a sleigh, and as we drove down the road, we picked up the neighbor kids, and so we arrived at the school, and that created a sensation. Many young boys were running, trying to jump on the sleigh. And I think it was Valentine's Day, actually, because I remember how we uh, decorated the Valentine's box. And so I hadn't missed Valentine's Day. As I was growing up, my sister, of course, was my very best friend. I also had other friends, but they lived not as close as my sister did, so she really was very close to me. But I remember Agnes Weeble, a good friend that I met in first grade, either first or second grade, and she was in my classes all the way through high school, and she went to BYU, and I saw her often there. She was a gifted artist, and she played the violin, which I unfortunately could not play, even though I had a violin that was my grandmother's. I didn't have lessons, 
and so I could not play, but Agnes played wonderfully well. And so not until I was about 65 years of age did I learn to play the violin. And not very well, but still played, and that gave me some satisfaction. In high school, we didn't catch the bus at the same place. We had to walk down a lane. This was also probably a mile away. We walked down the Okasons Lane through their farm land and then went to the in front of the Okasons house to catch the bus on Redwood Road. Mrs. Ogeson was always very kind to us, and on cold days we could come in and get warm. I remember walking <clears throat> through their fields and looking up at Mount Timpanogos over in the right-hand corner and snow blowing off of it and thinking of how cold we were. And even though we got warm a little bit in the Ogeson's house, Usually, we didn't really feel warm until about second period in high school. And I enjoyed being a twirler in the Jordan High School band. And the first time I ever saw a jet airplane was on um, a parade in Salt Lake. And as I threw my baton in the air, this thunderous noise went overhead and they have sent a couple of airplanes from Nellis Air Force Base just to do a flyover at the parade and so that was really fun but I dropped my baton. In high school I particularly enjoyed language classes. I took French and Spanish back to back. I also, a little confusing at times, if I couldn't think of it in one language, I would try the other. Uh, also, I enjoyed chemistry classes and any science classes I really enjoyed. Every summer, Uncle Parley, who owned several herds of sheep, would have a picnic in the mountains. Sometimes it was in the West Mountains and sometimes it was in the Wasatch Range, but he would always barbecue a sheep. And I remember one time my mother got stung with a bee because there were many of those pesky insects around the cooking meat. And her sister-in-laws put mud on her face to uh, help relieve the swelling and pain. But those were fun to be with the cousins, and sometimes we went to Liberty Park, and there was a little lake there, and you could rent a oh. motorboat. <laughs> we better cut that out, uh, which was pretty big <laughs> excitement for the little kids. Although we did not do any real vacations where we went somewhere, we did family things. And my grandmother, Spratling, <clears throat> used to have, I don't know if it was called, it wasn't really family night, but the family got together and the grandkids displayed talent. And I remember my cousins dancing and we couldn't do anything, my sister and I, so my mother gave us some uh, dance lessons and that cost a quarter every time. And my sister did quite well, but I was a bit awkward and so I remember the teacher working with me saying, shove, full, step, shove, full, step. And I don't know if I ever did it right. But that was the end of our dance lessons. My sister Maureen and I started BYU together. She had worked a year at my Uncle Raymond's uh, farm equipment shop uh, for a year before she started college. So we started together and uh, it was very exciting to actually be in college. I enjoyed most of my classes and the professors and 
I thought the students were extremely friendly. Every time you pass someone on a sidewalk, they said hello, and I thought that was very nice. As freshmen, we were supposed to wear a little blue beanie so that they could haze us if they wished to. And so I didn't always wear my beanie. But they had Y night where they lighted torches around the Y. So I remember hiking up to the Y and people helping to pull me up because it's pretty steep up there, but they had torches and so the Y was lighted at night. I don't know if they still do that, but the Y is still there. Do mm -hmm. you remember how much it costs to go to BYU for a semester? I think that was might be a hundred dollars per semester. Of course it was subsidized by the church and things were not as expensive in those days. This was right after the end of World War II. Where did you live? My sister and I stayed with our Aunt Grace uh, because she invited us. Her husband had died and I think that she, other relatives thought it would be good for us to live with her and so we we did that and it was she was very liberal as far as expenditures were concerned so our college did not cost a lot except books and tuition we often took the bus to school or we had arranged for rides for people to pick us up. I had intended to major in microbiology because that was what I really loved. And when I took a chemistry class with my sister, Professor Nichols took me aside one day and said, you should be majoring in chemistry. And I didn't think too much about it, so I let him change my schedule. And there I was, a chemistry major, which was a big fork in the road. It helped me to go to Richland, Washington, where we made plutonium and uranium for bombs. It was exciting because it was slightly dangerous. We had to wear special clothing and I remember some places had airlocks so you walk in and the door behind you closes and then the one in front of you opens so as not to let uh, anything escape. We also worked with glove boxes where our hands were in gloves inside a box. And unfortunately, I had a spill one night so that uh, this was plutonium. Plutonium nitrate. Plutonium nitrate, and it scatters. And so they had to tape the whole floor and, and close down that part of the lab so that it could be cleaned up. Fortunately, I didn't get any on myself. I graduated along with my sister in 1951. She had uh, a teaching position in Spanish Fork in junior high school, and I had three opportunities. I was accepted to be a trainee at the LDS hospital as a lab tech. I also had applied, uh, or I was interviewed by people from Phillips Petroleum, and they sent a letter of acceptance. But I chose Richland, Washington, because most of my friends were going there, and my father had worked there, and I was always curious about what Richland was like, and it was like a desert, but it was between two rivers. They needed the water uh, for the atomic piles that were scattered out in what we called the area, 
and these facilities were miles apart so that they would not, as I was saying, the different uh, facilities were miles apart to protect them from any incident which occurred at one site would not impact the other sites. There was one close to town and I worked there for a while and then I also worked out in the area where they produced plutonium. When I first went to Richland, we were assigned as a group of graduates to go to a junior high which was not being used during the summer. There we received some training and every Friday a paycheck which was really fun. In one of the classrooms, standing by the door, I saw this young man who looked very familiar and I thought in my mind, who is that? He looks like someone I know and yet he had never been to Utah and I had never been to California. So that was my future husband, Bob. Not that I knew that I would marry him or fell in love with him immediately, but it was just a brief moment of recognition. And so we thought we had met in the pre-mortal life. So Richland was a lot of fun. Uh, there were lots of young men to date and lots of good times. The, the church was a, a great place to go. There were lots of young people there. Uh, I met a lot of girlfriends there and had a, a great time in Richland. Bob had only been a member of the church for four months, having been baptized in Richland. And so we were not able to get married in the temple, or not sealed in the temple at that time. So after one year had elapsed, we were sealed in the Manti Temple. And then after one year, our children began to come along in succession until we had seven, which was a big family to take care of. There was lots of washing and lots of cooking and ironing and just being a mom. When we got married in Richland, we had signed up for housing and one day my fiance took me to a house and he said, oh, he." Uh, just walked up to the door and I said, well, who lives here? And he said, you do. And so I was really excited to have a three-bedroom ranch house with a pretty good-sized yard. Was there a garage? I don't remember. No, no garage, but uh, winters weren't too severe there, although we did get snow. When I was a little girl, I used to think that the whole world was contained within the Salt Lake Valley. I did not know that there was anything outside of those mountains. But after I got married, I was privileged to be taken to many places in the world. London, Paris, Moscow, um, several places in Scandinavia, Denmark, um, Rome, Rome Athens, uh, Athens Istanbul. Istanbul, and then I took a BYU tour to Israel and Egypt, and I really enjoyed that. I don't know which one was better, but they were both great. Uh, we were able to uh, take a Falucca ride on the Nile. The Nile flows northward, and the wind comes from the Mediterranean and blows south so that the ships are blown south with those huge sails and then they take the sails down and float back to wherever they want to be with the current. 
and it is much cooler on the water than it was out in the desert. Bob and I have been active in the church all of our married life and I have been able to serve in various callings three times in Relief Society, in the Ward Relief Society, and once in the Stake Relief Society Presidency. I really have enjoyed those experiences and have grown a lot. We also, after his retirement, were able to serve a proselyting mission in Indiana and a mission in the Philippines where we were missionary support, leadership training, and we also helped with the Mabuhay Deseret Foundation where we identified children with cleft palate or club feet or other maladies and were able to arrange for them to have treatment. And sometimes we actually took them to the hospital. And so that was a very satisfying experience. Later we served a six month mission in the <clears throat> Nauvoo Temple, having worked many years in the Dallas Temple. This was a great experience for us because we really learned the history of that area. And I skipped family the, the family history mission in Salt Lake. That was a one-year mission. We worked in a little cubicle in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building answering questions about um, church genealogical programs and it, the extraction process where I was <clears throat> able to order film and paper copies and CDs for people throughout the church who were doing extractions. I have always been impressed of how hard some birds and some fishes and other animals struggle to return to the place of their birth. And I have almost returned to Murray. I'm very close now. But what really interested me was a NOVA program where butterflies fly from Canada to Mexico. Those many, many miles. And they stay there for one generation and then they start back. But it takes four generations for them to get all the way back to where they came from. And so I wondered how do they communicate this information to following generations? So I would like to take this opportunity to communicate to the generations that follow me. I want you to know that I know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. I have had 72 years to test the principles of the Gospel. I am thankful to have been born into the church and to have served. I'm thankful for my posterity and for those who have married into our family. We welcome you and pray that you will all be blessed. And I do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. When I was a teenager, we, uh, of course, still had to work on the farm, and in the summer, sometimes my father would get us up at four o'clock because we could work in the fields when it was cool, and then we'd quit when it got hot. But he would come in and say, little girls, it's time to get up. The tadiokas have been up for hours. Now, the tadiokas were a Japanese family who lived, oh, maybe a mile from us, but they were good workers and they were always out in their fields early. And my sister used to say, well, 
how can they work in the dark? When my mother was expecting our little brother, we were so excited. I think I was three and my sister would have been four. But finally he came and we, my sister and I stayed with our grandparents. And my aunt and my grandmother apparently cut my hair and they gave me a Dutch cut, which my mother was horrified. They curled my sister's hair, but they just left mine straight and gave me a Dutch cut. But anyway, when little John did come home, we were so excited. We had a black buggy and we even took him for little walks, uh, not on the asphalt because there was none, but there was a rocky road that we took him on and we were so proud of him and we asked if we could give him some bacon because that was really good and we knew he would like that. When John was born, or just before, my sister and I talked about babies a lot, and I asked her, because I felt she knew most things, I asked her, how does Heavenly Father get those babies to come down here? And she said, he wraps them in lots of blankets, so when they fall to earth, they don't get hurt. And so after that, I wondered, I better keep a sharp eye out. There might be another one, but there was not. When we first were married, we saw a movie called Cheaper by the Dozen. And it was about a family who had a dozen children. And that looked so fun and so exciting. We thought that we would have 12 children, but as the years went by, our goal was diminished, and so we ended with seven, but we are very happy to have those seven all healthy. I had to have braces on my top teeth because uh, the permanent teeth had not come down yet, and one of them came down in the proper place and the other one did not. And so my first year in high school, I had these braces on and some little kids were teasing me, I guess, about the braces. And I said, well, I'm an Eskimo and I need these metal things on my teeth in order to chew the blubber. <laughs> <laughs> As I was growing up, I had the habit of making up stories and reciting them. So at night, my sister got tired of hearing these made-up stories, and so she had to pretend that she was asleep. But also, on the bus when I was in grade school, I used to tell stories, and so the little kids would come and sit by me so that I could tell them a story. And now, it's very hard for me to think up stories. <laughs>